there arguably cannot be any other industry sector within global investment markets with as strong and long-term fundamental drivers as that which can be seen in the healthcare sector. The combination of an aging demographic and the strong relationship of the greater need of medical attention as individuals move through later life, and the rapid and accelerating advances in clinical research across a variety of disease categories provide clear attractions for investment. However, this complex sector provides numerous challenges as the industry looks to deal with the requirement to provide better care to more people, but at lower cost. And so today we discuss some of the key drivers to the healthcare sector and how to navigate the current backdrop. Hello and welcome to the Investor Insights podcast, hosted by Kinnick & Co. My name is Gordon Smith, and in each episode, I'll be interviewing portfolio managers from across the investment industry to gain from their expertise in the specialist areas in which they invest, and to question them on the topical issues of today. Killick Co. is an independently owned wealth manager, which opened its first office in 1989 and provides services to help families save, plan and invest. And you can find more details of the unique ways in which we do that on our website, killick.com. In today's episode, we speak to Paul Major, Portfolio Manager of the London-listed Bellevue Healthcare Trust, or BBH. Paul has considerable experience within the healthcare sector, previously as a sell-side healthcare analyst and a top-rated one at that, including as a research partner at Redburn, before he joined Bellevue Asset Management, the Swiss specialist healthcare-focused investment manager, now managing over £9 billion in life science investments across a range of strategies. BBH uses a number of the attractive features available to the UK investment trust structure. It offers a 3.5% dividend payment, which is based on the end of year net asset value and paid largely out of capital, so it doesn't inhibit the portfolio construction, as well as a redemption feature offering investors an exit opportunity each year. And this helps to limit the degree to which the share price differs from the underlying portfolio valuation. It will also become clear in this discussion that the BBH strategy is a differentiated one, a concentrated, unconstrained approach, which focuses on those tools, products, and services, which are really enabling the required changes needing to be made within the healthcare sector in order to enhance efficiencies and also, crucially, improve the quality of care for patients. Hi, Paul. Good morning. How are you doing today? I'm very well. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Yeah, so the, the first question that we, we, we tend to ask um, in these discussions, just to kind of kick things off, is to try and get a bit of an insight into you and your, your typical working week. Um, and we were asking kind of people to kind of share any anecdotes that they've had from, from maybe a recent company meeting or research trip or, or just kind of getting to know what, what you've been reading recently, any articles or books that you'd, um, that you'd highlight. Sure. I, I must admit, when you sent these questions over, I was, I was, I was amused by, by the first one in the sense that I think I start every week for a plan of what my week's going to look like. And then usually by about half past eight on a Monday morning, it's, it's, it's changed. It's like, thrown out the window. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, to be honest with you, and our, our, our sort of work, work pattern um, goes through cycles because most of what's going on in healthcare is happening in, in the United States. So we obviously spend a lot of time seeing companies and regulators and physicians and things like that in, 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 in the US to understand what's going on with the market. So it's not just companies that we own or prospectively may want to own in the future. It's also key competitors. So, so it includes private companies and all sorts of things like that. But also you, you, you need to get the other side of the equation, which is speaking to doctors, speaking to payers who, who, who are ultimately going to decide whether or not to fund these things. And, and so when we, when we go on these trips, they tend to be a planned well in advance and, and extremely hectic. And, uh, Brett's actually in, in the U S this week. And then I go, um, next week, and I have to be honest, my, my schedule is, is, is pretty crazy. Um, I, over the course of that, you know, from, from breakfast through to dinner, meeting all sorts of, of different people, but it's incredibly interesting. And we try and also make sure that we both see. Uh, in, in, in key topic areas, we both see people that, um, uh, on, 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 on all the different facets of that particular area. So we can really understand it. So, so for example, um, we never invested uh, in the history of the trust. We've never really played 
the liver disease market so around around um, NASH and what was called MASH now for some reason, but, but we're around steatohepatitis hepatitis and all these obesity linked things. And so last year, when we were out in the US, we saw physicians and pretty much every company who's, who's active in the area for, for, for a deep dive, spent hours and hours on it. And in the end, we came to the same conclusion, which is this is probably not an area that we, that, that, that we want to um, invest into. But, but I think when, when you have the opportunity to, to, to consider potentially new areas of medicine and treatment, you, you know, new disease areas that previously haven't been considered treatable, you, you have to get a very holistic picture of what's going on in order to make a decision one, one way or the other. And, and, and even then the decisions aren't binary. It might be not yet rather than no or, 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 or yes. And if it's yes, you then got to decide, you know, which company, how much and, and so on and so forth. So, so we try as much as possible to, 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 to get a, a, as broad a view. And I think, I think sometimes as well, for me, the most interesting uh, aspect of these trips is actually meeting with doctors because you, you, you kind of imagine as, as a lay person, you, you imagine what it's like having patients come in and, uh, and, and, and the conditions that they face, the side, the, 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 the challenges that that might present to their quality of life and everything. And, and, and therefore you assume that they'll, 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 they'll be able to make these logical and informed decisions about what to do. And the reality is often much more complicated. You know, it's whether their insurance will pay for it, whether or not the treatment is compatible with, with their lifestyle. And whether or not they can stick to it, and the, 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 the demands that the physician has on their time, and so on and so forth. So, so, so sometimes you, you think you know a lot, and then you speak to a few people, and you realise that you actually don't know anything. Uh, so, so, so for me, I find that the, the really, really interesting uh, element of the job. It, it, you know, the best bit about being a, a fund manager is you, you get to meet loads of really interesting and intelligent people, and uh, and for me, that's always the the, the, the most exciting. Uh, uh, element of it. And, and we spend a lot of time, you know, reading all kinds of interesting anecdotal, um, scientific literature around, um, the area and, 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 and things that are going on to understand again, how the rubber hits the road and what the reality of, of, of change in healthcare is going to be like. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Meeting all of the stakeholders in the, in the healthcare process seems, seems critical in the, in the life science space for sure. Absolutely. And. Um, Maybe if you move on to the, the 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 portfolio, I mean, I've often heard you describe um, the, the the BBH strategy as being focused around that theme of of healthcare change, and and I wondered if you just to kind of frame the the whole conversation really, whether you could just give us a a kind of uh, an, an interpretation of that and, and and what it what it means for the resultant portfolio, which does look quite different from if you were to look at a kind of broad healthcare index. Could, could you give us a kind of brief description of of the approach and the types of themes that you're looking at? Yes, yeah, sure. So, so we, we are, we are intentionally index agnostic as you, as you allude to, you know, an index is a historical record of what's been successful in the past and, and, um, it, it becomes to a certain extent self-reinforcing because those companies that have been successful have sufficient cash flow. They can have our other companies and try and remain at the, uh, at, at the forefront of what's going on, but, but healthcare is also, um, Fascinating in, in the sense, and this is, I think for most people, very, very relatable. You, you, you have the, 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 the irresistible force and the, the, the immovable object analogy. And that if, if we look at society uh, and let's just keep it all in the UK to keep it very simple. If we, if, if we look at society, it's getting older, people are living longer. And unfortunately there is a divergence in what we call health span versus lifespan. So. Whilst you may expect to live many years longer than your parents did, there is not necessarily a guarantee that you will live those years in, in good health. So, so, so what this does is it, cre it creates this almost exponential demand, uh, for, for healthcare services in the future, which as an investor sounds wonderful. You, you, you know, few people can sit here and say with confidence that as far into the future as you want to project, we can see endless demand for products and services. But, but again, the challenge here is that somebody has to pay for all of this. And, and in a, in a, in a, in a, in a society where the dependency ratio is changing, um, and the healthcare costs and social welfare costs of those predominantly retired, predominantly economically inactive people, um, have to be borne by an increasingly narrow uh, group of, of, of taxpayers. So there is an understandable reluctance for people to pay 
more and more tax to fund all of this. And I, I think if, if you, you know, as we're, we're entering an election year here in the UK, you, you can see survey after survey basically telling you that people think the economy isn't working for them. You know, even people on middling incomes, um, you, you know, what, what people used to call upper middle class or 60, 70, 80,000 pounds a year. They, these people are saying, well, it's not working for me anymore. And I don't want to pay more tax because I don't feel ready that the public services I get for the tax I pay are worth paying for. So, so, so we have this conundrum of, we, we can see the demand is there. Innovation will create ever more avenues to prolong human lifespan and hopefully at the same time will prove human health span. Um, people realize they've got to work longer, but they probably don't want to. So, so how are we going to square the circle of all of this demand, all of this innovation and, 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 uh, an unwillingness, for want of a better word, of paying for it. Well, well, well the answer is it has to be efficiency. And, and, and the great news for healthcare is it's a horrendously inefficient business. So in as much as I want people to invest in healthcare because self-evidently that's my job, if, if I, I, I can all equally present the industry as something that you wouldn't want to invest in, in the sense that it's horribly wasteful, you know, one in four dollars spent in healthcare in the world, there's no medical benefit what, what, whatsoever. Many of the interventions are of questionable uh, quality, patients have limited choice, et cetera, et cetera. So, so when, when you, again, you restrict yourself from it and you look at it, you, you, you sort of think this is something that's fallen into existence. It's not been planned or structured to, to meet the needs of the, of, of, of the customer base. Um, and, and, and absolutely therefore, if you, if you wanted to take a step back and look at it. Uh, you could do it all in, in, incredibly differently. And it, as, as you walk around the world, you know, again, we, we have this tendency to fall into a very narrow political discussion in the UK of Labour say the Tories underinvest in, 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 in healthcare and the Tories say that in real terms, the budget goes up every year. Both of these things are true at the same time. Uh, the challenge is that, that the, 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 the capacity of the healthcare system to absorb additional capital is pretty much infinite. And so no matter how much money you give it, you, you, it won't make the progress that you, you, you want and expect. So you have to turn, turn, turn your head uh, in a different direction and say, well, how could I do this in a completely different way? And that's, that's the prism through which we view everything. So the reason our portfolio looks very different, um, to, to the benchmark or to perhaps what people might expect is we're not looking at the world as it is today saying let's invest in, in, in today's winners. We're saying, what does the world have to look like in five or 10 years time? What are the products or services that will inevitably scale as part of that transformation that has to happen? And they're the things we, we, we want to own. You, you know, I'll give you a couple of, 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 of that very simple examples. There, there are, um, there are papers out evaluating AI driven uh, software tools that, that record doctor's notes in real time. So, so effectively there's a dictaphone sitting on the, on the desk when the, when the doctor's seeing a patient and it's taking notes and it's transcribing them and, and they are shown to be as efficient as a doctor's own notes, uh, edited by a medical secretary. But of course, uh, that takes virtually no time to produce because it's being produced in real time. So, so you look at something like that and you look at the cost benefit of rolling that sort of software out across the world and we've both into positions that have done this. And it's, it's enormous because what, what, it, what it means is that they, they can see two or three more patients in a day because they don't have to stop as early to do their, their clerical work. And then their clerical work takes much less time. So they have more free time at the evenings and the weekend to spend with their family. So they're happier. So they're going to carry on working for longer. So you end up with this, this, this double-edged positive of, of more productive, more efficient and happier people, because this isn't just again about, about squeezing the, 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 the lemon to get more work out of all these, all, all these people who are already very stressed working in healthcare. It's also about, uh, wanting them to, to, to stay in the business because one of the biggest challenges we have for healthcare in the long term is, is around labor. You, you know, this is an industry people don't want to work in anymore. Um, so, so that's just, 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 just one example of something that sounds incredibly simple, but if, if if, if it were rolled out and if it were scaled, you can see these kind of tremendous benefits. And, and, and when we look across healthcare, we see millions of tiny things that can cumulatively make a big difference. So, so the challenge for us is, is picking the ones that we think, um, you can monetize as a business 
and 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 will become most important in in for want of a better word, kind of de bottlenecking the the, the the kind of healthcare sausage machine that we all uh, go into when we when we start the process of going to see a doctor because we don't feel well. Yeah, interesting. And thanks for the the, the examples as well. That that kind of puts the um, puts the picture together. And. Um, I mean, unfortunately, investment markets can tend to be kind of quite short term in looking and kind of talked about the kind of the, the long term um, uh, theme that's clearly here. But if, if, we, if we look at investment market returns over the last couple of years, it's it's been kind of driven by primarily by kind of very dominant macroeconomic factors, um, in many cases kind of overriding the fun- fundamentals that, that, that are going on. I wonder if it, if it was possible to kind of provide a summary. Obviously, the healthcare sector has gone through quite a um, quite a period since the, the or through the pandemic and 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 as we've kind of emerged from it. Are you able to give us a kind of summary of of how the underlying healthcare sector is has been performing, how it's emerged from the the pandemic, whether it be I don't know, kind of what, what you would be looking at in terms of procedure volumes or. R and D productivity. What what, what 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 would you point to in in kind of looking at overall healthcare sector performance? Yeah, sure. I, I think that, that that's a really really interesting question. Before before we delve into it, I think one has to separate the the development of drugs from everything else. So drugs are only about ten percent of healthcare expenditure, but they are about and um, forty to fifty percent of of any large global healthcare benchmark. Uh, in terms of market cap, so it's the Johnson and Johnsons, the Pfizer's, the Eli Lilly's that that, that dominate um, the, the 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 investable value that's out there, and the business of inventing drugs is much more serendipitous and uncertain than anyone would would really care to believe, uh, and that's why governments dish out so much money in 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 in, in research grants to universities and things to kind of keep the train on the tracks because the the, the truth is that it's uh, it's incredibly unpredictable and very very uh, inefficient so i think um we've been on a a 20 year journey of recognizing and acknowledging that r&d is not obviously scalable and doesn't necessarily meet uh robust um projections around a return on on invested capital and um, so so again it's something that, that that probably you wouldn't necessarily want to invest in every now and then though something comes along that's very big and exciting and the potential with charity rewards from that can be very very significant um so so i think i, th- I think drugs remain and always will remain a market of it's a, it's a, it's a collection of unique assets and you can't generalize you know just because one biotech company does well. It doesn't tell you that any other biotech company is going to do well, for example. Um, so, so, so I think, I, I think, um, the industry continues to try and, um, streamline decision making, fail faster and cheaper than it used to, but, but I don't see very much obvious progress. And, and, you know, the last couple of years, certainly if you, with the absence of kind of Nova Nordisk and Eli Lilly, I don't think large pharma companies have, have, have been a particularly exciting or compelling place. To be invested. Coming back to the rest, though, you know, you, you, you again, you, you touched on a really interesting topic, which is that the pandemic, you know, a bit like the travel industry, the the, the, the pandemic hit the healthcare industry very, very hard because it, it had to effectively close its doors, so shutter capacity, reserve capacity for surges of COVID, uh, introduce spatial and temporal distancing that meant they couldn't work at anything like capacity, and then come out of that. Um, dealing with significant challenges around labor, capital expenditure for hospitals and all these sorts of things. So, so, so that, uh, took a while to, to, to kind of begin to normalize. I think early in 2023, the signs were clear that we were on a path toward normalization where, where we are now looking back, um, at 2023 in the rear view mirror, I think we can say with a high degree of confidence that the, 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 the second half of 2023, so, so including the winter season where COVID and flu were really a big consideration. Um, we're seeing, uh, older people who are the key consumers of healthcare behaving in normal ways. So people are going for routine medical examinations. They're going and, and, and having non-essential treatment done when, when, when it's recommended by the physicians and, um, all, all of the procedural volume trends are, are very much back to where you imagined they would have been if you'd have 
extrapolated from 2018, 2019 year as if the pandemic uh, d- didn't, didn't happen. There are still challenges in some markets around capacity availability because of staffing. And, and there are markets where there are very significant challenges around waiting lists, for example, the UK, um, being, being, being case in point, everybody will be familiar with all, all, all of the headlines there and, and that will inevitably, uh, take a significant amount of time and additional resource, uh, to, 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 to clear those backlogs, but everything is pretty much back to normal. So, so we, we feel that we're, we're living in a, in, in very much a, a, a post pandemic environment now that the pandemic didn't change very much. Um, but there were two interesting things that come out of it. One, one of them, uh, some of your listeners probably find very irritating, but it was necessary, which is, um, the triaging of patients before you can see a GP. So you probably have to have some kind of a telephone consultation in order to, 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 um, see a GP, which is great because, um, something like 25 or 30% of GP appointments are considered medically unnecessary after they've happened, which is clearly a pretty big problem because the money has been spent. The resources have been wasted at that point. So gatekeeping over the phone or via some, some kind of uh, video tool is, is, a, is a very sensible idea and it's become uh, ubiquitous following the, the, the pandemic. The other thing that's happened is that the, the, the pandemic reminded everybody that, um, you know, nothing was set in stone. So when all these people started turning up with this, this new and unknown respiratory disease that turned out not really to be a respiratory disease, but to be what's called an endothelitis, excuse me, there, there was no optimal way to treat them. And, and the UK, again, um, the, the, the NHS does, does very occasionally surprise everybody by, by, by being amazing. And one of the things it did in the pandemic was, um, uh, Imperial ran a, a bunch of studies and they were reporting results in real time, um, about different interventions and how effective they were. And, and we saw significant changes in, in how COVID patients were managed into the hospital and then treated and, and then, and then discharged with follow-up treatment and so on. And, and I think that really served to highlight to everybody that, um, you, you know, trying new things, trying to be better, being innovative participating in clinical studies. These are all really, really good things. And they're things that I think outside the U S many countries had shied away from, uh, you, you know, standardized rate procedural treatment algorithms that have become very, very commonplace. I mean, it's very amusing at the moment here in the, here in the UK, uh, we're having a, a big, a big outbreak of respiratory disease. Lots of people are getting, um, chest infections that require antibiotics. The NHS treatment algorithm is you have to have a drug called amoxicillin. It's your first, uh, treatment for chest infection, but the bacteria that's circulating when doesn't respond to amoxicillin. So everybody's going to the NHS, getting antibiotics, taking those, getting worse, going back to the NHS, getting new antibiotics, chasing those and getting better. And the machine doesn't seem to have the ability to, to turn around and go, let's just do option two first, and we could save a huge amount of time and money and suffering. But. Um, we, we are getting better at those sorts of things, I think, and, and, and trying to be a, a little bit more flexible and that can only benefit everybody in, in, in the longer term. I, I, you know, there, there are very few diseases where you can say treatment is truly optimized and, and, and we can do better or improve. Um, so, so yeah, so we, we, we feel, we feel outside of, of, of kind of pharmaceuticals, everything is, 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 is coming along quite nicely. We are seeing investments into some, uh, kind of, uh, productivity tools, which is, which is exciting. And then there's something going on in the U S which is a transition toward, um, value-based care, which is, which is this complete transformation of how doctors get, um, assessed and, 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 and remunerated. So, so they used to have what's called a, uh, a fee for service model. So effectively a doctor, you will be paid for the work you did, which creates a per- perverse incentive, of course, to do more work. Um, and it makes you very reactionary as well. So, 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 um, the, the, because there's no incentive for preventative healthcare. In fact, if someone doesn't get sick, you're doing yourself out of future revenue. You could argue, um, they, 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 this alternative model began to be evaluated about 10 or 15 years ago, whereby effectively you pay doctors a per capita, uh, fee for, for, for looking after, um, somebody's health and well-being, 
and they're actuarially baselined when, when you take on this contract. And, and so for this group, let's say 10 or 20,000 people, you'd expect a certain number of cancers, diabetes, whatever it might be. If over time, the, the, the incidence of, of these conditions is lower than expected, the doctors get a bonus. And on the other hand, uh, they might actually have to pay back some of their capitation payment if, if outcomes are worse. And, and so what, what this causes is a profound change in behavior where doctors then focus their resources on the patients they believe have the largest potential to become sick. So in other words, if you're young, fit and healthy, you know, somebody like you wouldn't get a look in, but actually what that means is that there's a lot more time uh, uh, being devoted to somebody who, who has some emergent health conditions and is, is probably in their, let's say their fifties. And, and the data shows the model works incredibly well. The patients are happier. The doctors are happier because they actually feel they're making a difference. They're not just reacting to what comes in the door. They're proactively planning and working with patients to turn around. You, you know, there's a huge amount of satisfaction of uh, your overweight patient who was on the road to type two diabetes actually loses some weight, feels better and doesn't get type two diabetes. Th th then you feel, you know, I've achieved something. Um, so, so, so everybody thinks that, that, that this is a winning model and, and it's really serving to highlight the, 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 the benefits and application of, of preventative healthcare. And that's the direction we all really want to go. And it's very interesting. You look at some less developed countries, um, South America is a good example. There are a couple in South America uh, they spend vastly less per capita on healthcare, but they have outcomes that aren't that different to what you see in the United States. And the reason is that all the money gets spent on preventative healthcare. And if you prevent something, the costs of treating it, funnily enough, are zero. So you can, you can achieve the same outcome with, with, uh, with, with, with vastly different resources. So I think that's going to be one of the kind of mega trends of the next few decades is really using, uh, predictive analytics, you know, AI type things, algorithms, actuarial data, electronic health records to, to really focus resources on the people that most need them and, and, and the extreme uh, version of this, which I don't know whether or not it'll ever happen, but it's an idea that's being evaluated is, 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 you know, live births, you take a genetic sample at birth and you, you, you look at people's genetic, um, predisposition to certain conditions, and then they're effectively in lifelong preventative management. So, you know, you're at higher risk of diabetes or Alzheimer's disease or whatever. We know these biomarkers of progression of these diseases. So. We're going to have you in every five years and we'll look at these things and we're going to give you dietary advice and lifestyle advice and later probably medication to try and stop you crossing over from being at risk to having a disease. And then I think that that's kind of the, 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 the ultimate outcome here, because what we all really want is to be healthy. I think how long we live, we live, it's, it's, it's nice to live a long life, but, but it's, it's, it's much better to, to, to lead, lead a life of, um, of, of, of health and dignity and independence and, and these sorts of preventative approaches can further that goal uh, for all of us. So that's the very, very long time, long, you know, direction of travel. And there, there are various steps along the way. And uh, we, we follow all of those closely. And I think, um, over the coming yeah, years, you'll, you'll see more of those sorts of things creeping into, into the portfolio in a more visible manner. So there's some really interesting themes going on here. Thank, thank you for that. Um, I, I can't not have you um, on this discussion and not talk about um, GLP-1s and, and weight loss drugs. I mean, we often talk about the kind of narrow breadth of the market last year and that kind of leads you kind of to the technology sector, but it's absolutely the case in, in healthcare as well with, with Novo and, and, and Eli Lilly. I mean, I, I mean I, I'll, give you, I'll give a plug to your, to, your, to your blog and your fact sheets. I know you've kind of talked a lot about this space in your commentary, which um, which is always kind of really interesting reading. But I, I wondered if you could lay out some of your brief thoughts on um, on what's happened to the weight loss drug sector and market expectations here, and how you see that developing over the coming years. Sure. So, so just as a, a very quick background, so GLP one drugs; these are injectable drugs, and they target hormones related to satiety, and they they prime your body 
for uh, the absorption of nutrients from food. So basically they're produced by your gut in response to food entering your stomach. Um, they were developed initially for type two diabetes to sensitize people to, 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 um, insulin and things like that, because what happens in type two diabetes is not that initially you can't make insulin. That's type one diabetes. Uh, it's that insulin doesn't have the same effect that it should do. And consequently your blood sugar remains elevated. It has all sorts of then secondary hormonal effects that mean that, that you're, you're more at risk from various cardiovascular, um, yeah. risk relating to, to obesity, which is the primary driver of, 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 of type two diabetes in the first place. So we, these drugs have been around for a really long time, like over 20 years. Uh, when they first came out, they were short acting injections. You probably know if ever you've overeaten, you get that feeling of nausea. Well, if you inject yourself with a short acting GLP one, uh, uh, you, you will likely not vomit because it's exactly that same sensation of, oh, my stomach's over full. I need to empty it. Um, so over the last 20 years, we're on kind of the third generation of these drugs that, 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 that they become more sophisticated. So they're long acting. You inject them once a week rather than several times a day. And because they have this flatter profile, they, they, they don't make you feel sick. Now, looking at them in type two diabetes, what we discovered was they have what what I'm known as pleiotropic effects. So sometimes what we all know about side effects. So unexpected things that drugs do that are bad. Pleiotropic effects is the opposite. So unexpected things that drugs do that are good. And um, targeting the GLP-1 hormone system has all kinds of secondary benefits on cardiovascular health that were somewhat unexpected. So the conclusion of all of this is that um, you should use these things much earlier in the treatment of type two diabetes. Now, absent any of that, this feeling of satiety, feeling full means you don't eat as much. So you lose weight, which is obviously a benefit in type two diabetic patients because they are generally overweight. So, um, Nova and Nordis and the latter Eli Lilly, um, thought they developed these things for, for, for weight loss and, and, and the history of weight loss drugs has been, uh, very complicated in that, uh, people have. It's people have pursued a number of, um, ill judged modalities to make people lose weight. Uh, the, in, in, in the eighties, it was predominantly, uh, various types of amphetamine, which isn't really good for self-evident, um, side effects, uh, mostly cardiovascular, you, you, you know, taking speed every day is more likely to lead to a heart attack and damage to your heart. Uh, so, so they, they fell out of favor. Then we had some very unfortunate ideas, uh, around stopping, uh, people absorbing fat in the gut. Of course, everything you put to your mouth, if you don't absorb it, it's going to come out somewhere. And, uh, so, so, uh, again, we'll, we'll spare the listeners, the, uh, the, the, the obvious conclusions around side effects, but that's not a route that, uh, you know, you, 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 you want to go down either. So, so the idea of being able to suppress appetite without obvious side effects is really, really compelling. And that's what these GLP one drugs do. And then in the summer, um, Novo and Lily are doing a bunch of studies. So, so drug companies do two kinds of studies. They do studies to get drugs on the market, which are regulatory studies. And then they do what we call phase four trials, which is basically marketing. And, and generally, um, what marketing studies do is they prove something that's glaringly obvious to everybody, but enable you to market your drug in a more convincing manner. So, um, shocker drugs that have been proven to improve cardiovascular health and make you lose weight, improve cardiovascular health and weight loss in people with cardiovascular risk who are overweight. Uh, this was one of the remarkable uh, headlines that came out in the summer and it caused this huge level of, um, excitement around GLP one drugs, which, which is not unfair, right? You, you know, most people, if there was a shortcut to losing weight, then, then they take it. Um, where, where this all got a bit weird was that people started saying, well, all these other diseases, you know, no one's going to have heart attacks anymore. Nobody's going to snore or have sleep apnea. Nobody's going to need joint replacement because their joints aren't going to wear out. Um, nobody's going to get diabetes, type one diabetes. And so, 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 so it was a, it was a, it was a classic kind of jump the shark moment, you, you know, and then it spread to no one's going to eat McDonald's. No one's going to drink beer. Uh, we're, we're all going to do yoga. So you've got to, got to buy Lululemon chairs. Um, I, 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 and it kind of went into this crazy tailspin in the second half of, of, of last year. So, so that's, that's largely dissipating now. And I think people recognize that, um, you, you know, in a world full of ever more people who are generally overweight and generally unhealthy, 
the incremental benefit these drugs have is a positive, but it's not going to change the healthcare system. So that, that's the good thing. And that's separate to the broader question of, is this going to be an absolutely vast market? Well, the GLP-1 market in type 2 diabetes is already worth over $20 billion a year. So the short answer to that is, yes, it's going to be absolutely massive. It could possibly be the biggest market for pharmaceuticals we've ever seen. Um, but then that raises a second question, which is, what does the competitive landscape look like three, four, five years from now? And, you know, lots and lots of people are working on um, more potent inhibitors of these hormone systems. There are five or six hormones linked together. So ones that target more than one hormone system at a time. It's really complicated. A Venn diagram of the intersection of all these hormones that we, we kind of understand, but you don't really know. So, so you can't just sit there and say, well, if I target three hormone systems, it's better than two, for example. Do I agonize or antagonize them? These different things. So, so, so I think what we can say with a great deal of certainty is the Obesity bandwagon has very much left the station. Every large pharma company is all over this, buying biotech companies with, with drugs that may or may not be successful. Everybody's looking for that holy grail of something that has profound weight loss, is very tolerable, um, and, and perhaps even is a pill rather than an injection. Because not everybody, even though it's only once a week, not everybody will take an injection. And so, so I think, um, the, the, this this market is going to continue to evolve very rapidly. We don't own any shares in Eli Lilly or Novo Nordis because in order to justify the share prices that those companies have now, you have to assume they hang on to a very large amount of market share in a rapidly evolving market that is going to grow for a very long time. And and, and we feel somewhat uncomfortable uh, with, 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 with that assumption because uh, there is clearly significant ground or improvement in these drugs. You know, the, the weight loss that they give is good, but it's not, it's not profound. And, and, and it, it rapidly reverses on cessation of the drugs. So tolerability and cost become very, very big considerations here. You, you know, if you want to stay thinner, you need to be able to afford to stay on these drugs forever. And you need to be able to tolerate staying on them forever. And they're not free of side effects. Um, I think there's also some interesting questions about, you know, what happens if you, uh, really, really tweak these molecules, you know, what, what, what happens to, uh, the reward centers of the brain. So there's an interesting study that, um, was done with one profoundly uh, powerful agent and, uh, people lost interest in eating food, but they also lost interest in alcohol, smoking, speeding, uh, taking illegal drugs, having sex, pretty much doing anything. So, so, uh, you, you know, the, the, you end up in this Orwellian situation where, um, you know, everybody sits at home all day, never does anything, but they look fabulous and thin on Zoom. It's not really a world, I think, where we all kind of want to live in. So, so, so it's, it is genuinely very hard to know how far along this continuum you can push before you, you, you go in a direction that maybe isn't the one that, 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 that people, pick, pick people wish, wish to go in. So, um, I think it's fascinating. I, I think it's, undoubtedly a big opportunity, I would say with all the disruption that happened in the second half of the year, personally, I feel much more confident buying companies involved in the treatment of type one and type two diabetes. So insulin sensing, insulin pumps, you know, sleep apnea companies, uh, orthopedics areas, you know, kidney disease areas that got really, really beaten up in this, you know, these drugs are going to change the world argument in the second half of last year. Because what I know there is these drugs won't make that much difference. The patients exist today. The markets are real and, and because they exist today and they're real, I can model them with a high degree of confidence. When I think about what does the optimal weight loss drug look like five years from now, I have literally no idea. So it, it becomes, it becomes harder to, 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 to do that confidently. So that's why we have this, uh, as you alluded to, some, somewhat controversial, um, view in some people's eyes around these GLP-1 drugs, which is, yes, it's a really huge opportunity, but not one that we feel comfortable playing directly at the yeah. moment. Yeah. Understood. Yeah. Thank you for, for going through that. That's, that's clear. Um, cool. Our, our, our standard final question, we, we talked about a lot of areas already, um, I asked the, 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 the speaker to, to kind of highlight if there was one particular area of the universe that you have a particularly high conviction in at the moment. I don't know whether there's, obviously there's a lot of um, 
that kind of winner loser debate that went that we went through last year. You talk about kind of, kind of depressed um, areas, but would, would there be kind of one long term area that you you would particularly pick out as being kind of um, uh, high conviction at the moment? Yeah, I, I mean, I think if we look back at our historical success and we think about the future and 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 the, the opportunities, um, the thing I get most excited about is is molecular diagnostics. So, disease prevention is always better than, than, than cure. And the ability to, to um, detect disease in very, very early stages uh, makes all, all the difference because you can preserve function if it's degenerative and if it's something like cancer, you know, treatment options become much easier before something is spread throughout the body or, or, or cause significant organ damage. So, so um, I, I think molecular diagnostics and the ability to do surveillance r remains for us the, 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 the most uh, profound opportunity. So we're very focused on uh, cancer screening. Um, and then related to that, there's two other areas. There's something called um, minimal residual disease testing, which is a, a nascent thing um, that's becoming more common now and will become very, 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 very common in the future. So this is effectively when you have a biopsy done on a tumor, um, at the same time, a, a specific, almost unique to your cancer diagnostic test is created. And then after you've had your surgical or, 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 or chemotherapy intervention and been given what we hope is the all clear, we can then use this incredibly sensitive test to monitor you after that, to make sure we've absolutely got rid of this, this tumor. Cause the problem with tumors is that if you don't get them all, they tend to come back. And because you've hit them with everything in the arsenal the first time around, they mutate. And then when they come back, they, they, they're usually nastier and more problematic the second time around. So if we can have a much, much higher degree of confidence that we've, we, 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 we've done an effective job in the first instance, then people are far more likely to have a, 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 a positive longer term outcome. So detecting disease earlier, very important. Um, and then we can hopefully use more surgical interventions rather than chemotherapy type interventions. And then making sure whatever intervention we've chosen, uh, is, 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 is the best one. And then, and then the, the ultimate direction of travel here is, is, is something which isn't ready for the mainstream yet, but maybe, maybe one day will be. So it's definitely worth prosecuting, uh, is, is, is this idea of, of what we call liquid biopsy, which is routine screening for uh, early signs of cancer. Uh, this is very much the holy grail of, 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 of medicine. You know, cancer, unfortunately, is going to get two and three of us, um, one way or the other. And um, the earlier you can know that you've got it, the more options that, that you have. The challenge here is, of course, we're all generally leading a uh, happy, healthy lives. And the last thing you want is for otherwise healthy people to be told they may or may not have cancer, resulting in a bunch of inexpensive and invasive tests, firstly, and then secondly, um, uh, the stress and worry, obviously, of receiving that initial, we think you've got cancer, to then find, you know, three, four weeks later, someone says, well, we can't find it. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean I haven't got it? Or does that mean that? that uh, you can't find it. So, so there's no, this, the, this is Pandora's box in the sense that if these tests aren't really, really, really specific, you're, you're going to flood the healthcare system with worried well people and, uh, and, and simply telling them that you can't find anything doesn't mean it's not there. So we need to be very, very, very sure before we unleash this on the well, uh, because the unintended consequences could be, could be quite significant, but if we can make progress toward that actually being, being a useful, uh, uh, a useful tool for physicians, then you, you, you can imagine that, that, that world, can't you? Because it'll be a case of, you know, you'll be said to be, oh dear, yeah, I've tested positive for whatever. I've now got to go and have, have my tumor zapped, which will involve, you know, radiotherapy is going to take 30 minutes and then you'll carry on with your life again. So a completely different reality to, 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 to the one that we, we live in today. So that's. That's tremendously exciting. It's a very, very, very long term kind of, kind of outcome. And then, and then related to all of this as well, the, the same principle behind the minimal residual disease testing 
is, is um, immunological uh, cancer treatment. And the first generation, this will likely be vaccines, but the second generation is probably more of an off the shelf product where again, when we do that biopsy, we, we, we understand, you know, we all get tumors all the time, but the immune system gets rid of them for us. And then unfortunately every now and then for various reasons, that process gets interrupted and the tumor gains a foothold and then, and then we have cancer. If you could understand how it slipped through the net of the immune system in the first place, you could redirect the immune system's attention back to all the tumor. And then hopefully your body can manage the thing on its own. And there are a couple of interesting ideas, um, that exist already that, that have the potential to take us down that road. We're, we're not invested in any of the moment, but we're monitoring the science very, very carefully. And I think again, that, that could be tremendously exciting. So, so that whole arc of early diagnostic treatment surveillance, tailored disease management, I think could be the most profound medical thing that we could ever do beyond obviously vaccinations for infectious diseases, which, you know, have transformed the lives of billions of people around the world over the last sort of 50, 60 years. Absolutely. Extremely interesting. Yeah. But Paul, I really appreciate you, you chatting to us today. Always interesting. Um, but thanks very much for your time. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Investor Insights Podcast. You can contact info at killick.com, referencing the podcast for more information on any of the topics discussed or for further details on the services offered by Killick & Co. This podcast is not personal advice. The content is intended for educational purposes only and is not investment research or a recommendation to buy or sell any financial instrument or product or to adopt any investment strategy. The value of your investments can rise as well as fall, and you could get back less than you invested. Past performance is not a guide to future performance. The investments referred to in this podcast may not be suitable for all investors, and you should seek advice from a qualified investment advisor. Killick & Co is authorised and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, the FCA.